Hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to see you tonight. I'm. Um, uh, thank you very much for being there. I wish I could be with you in person. Instead, I am in my office in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the U.S. And uh, it's three in the afternoon here. Uh, but I know it's the evening for you. So um, my talk today is called uh, "Is Consent the Key to Ethically Good Sex?" For some people, it is surprising that philosophy would talk about sex. Philosophy is seen as taking care of big issues, life, death, knowledge, justice, and sex seems to be something natural, personal, intimate. But as I will show here, philosophy, because of its interest in our actions, in why we do them, in how we should treat ourselves and others, is centrally interested in our daily lives and our daily relations to others especially through sex. Moral philosophy focuses on the evaluation of our actions, which means it focuses on finding criteria to decide what are the right and the wrong ways to act. Sex is a very important part on most people's lives, and it can both be a source of immense joy and a source of very serious harm. Therefore, it is a very important topic for moral philosophy. And what I want to show you uh, here is that philosophy gives us a very interesting prism to analyze our sex lives, how they should not look like, how we want them to be, etc. And I want to show you this through a particular concept, the concept of consent. So for purposes here, sexual consent. So since the end of the 20th century, and especially in the aftermath of the hashtag MeToo, the concept of consent has left the realm of philosophy, political theory, and women's and gender studies to become a key term of, public of the public debate on sexuality and gender equality. Consent, understood broadly as valid agreement, is conceived as the right criterion to distinguish between morally good sex and bad sex, between especially rape and sex. A good example can be found of this can be found in legal changes. For instance, in Germany in 2016, they passed a, a new uh, law about rape that says no means no. Like you, it is not permissible to have sex with someone against their unambiguous will. The same change has occurred in Britain, in Belgium, in Canada, in Cyprus, in Greece, in Iceland in Ireland, in Luxembourg. And I know that there has been a lot of discussions in Israel about how to change rape law because historically rape law has been only rape, uh, it has been only that women can be raped and only a force was used. Um, Sweden went even further in 2018 in defining rape as any form of sex without consent. So their rape law introduced a new offense called uh, negligent rape for cases where courts found consent had not been established, but the perpetrator had not intended to commit rape. These debates are not only legal debates. In media, in TV shows and political platforms, there's a growing agreement that consent is the tool to challenge the multiple ways in which patriarchy has shaped our sexuality. Consent thus would be a great tool not only to fight sexual violence, but also to bring a change in sexual practices towards better, more egalitarian sex. This idea appears clearly, for instance, in the debate about what is called affirmative consent, that is the requirement that consent would be verbally communicated at all times. And this view in general is coherent with the change that has happened in sexual ethics since the 1970s, which have seen a shift from what is called a substantive moral evaluation of sexuality. So where we think in terms of what practices should be allowed, which practices should be allowed, which practices are wrong, to a more formal and procedural view in which we think that what makes sex morally acceptable is the fact that it happens between consenting adults. So, what is generally at stake in consent um, is the question to know what is morally good sex and can consent help us figure that out? So the first question, as I said at the opening of this talk is why ask a moral question? 
especially we have this intuition that sex does not and should not belong to the realm of morality. Why? There are two sorts of reasons that are kind of opposed. There are some people who think for religious reasons that sex is something sacred among married people and therefore is necessarily good, that it is linked to love, it is linked to God and religion, and this is great. And then there are reasons that come from a suspicion against the way that sex has been historically moralized. Uh, what I mean by that is that, for instance, certain practices have been deemed immoral and have led to uh, persecution. I'm thinking typically of the prohibition of non-heterosexual sex. Because we think, okay, like the fact that some people thought they had a right to decide what was right or, and wrong about sex led to homosexuals being treated very badly. So we should not have more views about sex. There's also the general idea drawn uh, from psychoanalysis that sex is something natural that has been uh, repressed for uh, moral reasons and on the other hand, and, and instead should be left alone. So that's the sort of main idea of what is called the sexual revolution, where we see uh, people saying, well, sex is natural, leave us alone. We should live sex like natural human beings. But what you see there is that even that, saying sex is natural, therefore it is good. It is a moral take. It is in the sense that it is saying there is a wrong and a right way to look at sex. So in reality, first, the argument that sex is natural doesn't mean that it wouldn't be right or wrong, right? Like there are things that are natural and right and things that are natural and wrong. And second, there are good reasons to think that sex is first and foremost a sexual practice. To give you an example, for instance, um, statistics about how people have been having sex show that until the 1970s, approximately, uh, people were not having oral sex. Oral sex is a very new thing. And there's even a, a feminist that I really like who said, surprisingly, uh, men have started wanting to uh, get oral sex when women have started to open their mouth to ask for uh, more freedom. So is there a link there? But that shows you that what is normal and natural sex varies widely in history and, in, and among societies. So it makes sense to ask moral questions about sex. Through consent, we're now asking two different moral questions. Um, consent helps us to distinguish between good sex and bad sex in two different senses. First, between what is called morally right and morally wrong sex. That is between the sex that should be permissible and the sex that should be impermissible. But this is not the only question when we talk about good sex. We're also talking about the distinction between morally good and morally objectionable. That is, for instance, practices that are not necessarily forbidden or punishable, but, are, but that are still wrong. For instance, one can imagine a situation in which you have two people, Tal and Noah, Tal, so you see, I, I purposely take uh, names that can be both female and male names so that we don't decide um, if there's a gender dynamic there. So Tal insists to have sex with Noah, uh, who's their partner, even though Noah does not actively desire to have sex at that moment. Tal does not exert, exert any form of coercion on Noah. And Noah accepts to have sex with Tal in order to make Tal's insistence stop. In that case, one could argue that the sex is consented to. Like Noah didn't say no, Noah maybe even said yes, but it is not morally good because it does not respect the desire and the will of Noah. So for the longest time, we thought that consent was only used to choose what is permissible versus unpermissible, but it actually also can help us think about what is good and what is not good. So, um, and, and I think historically it's very important that we're now in a, in a society and in a world where we wonder, okay, what are the positive ways to think about sex? Like how can we make sex not only not bad, 
but also really good. So why consent? In everyday life, um, we use consent means either to agree to something that is offered or suggested by someone else. Like, for instance, someone wants to borrow my bike, ask me and I agree, so I consent. Or in specific cases, consent can mean an active choice. For instance, in legal contracts, each contracting party consents to the consent of the contract. That, that means that you choose it and you agree to follow it. The idea is that it expresses our autonomy, our freedom to choose for ourselves. This is why so much power is given to consent in contract law. Since consent is conceived by law as the external sign of your will, you are obligated to honor a contract that you consented to. And sexual autonomy is particularly important as it involves our bodies and the most private part of our bodies, so parts of ourselves that are particularly vulnerable. What is the problem then? Why doesn't it go without saying that consent is the key to ethical sex? Well, actually there are two different issues. The first one is that autonomy is not as simple as it seems, especially in sexual matters. When we think of autonomy, we have this sort of uh, good picture of an independent human being who decides exactly what he or she wants. Uh, like every choice they make is like when you choose between tea and coffee, no, nothing pressures you, nothing determines your choice in advance, except for your own taste. So in, in that case, exerting my autonomy means that I literally follow my own law. But here we find the problems that philosophers call the problem of free will. Are we choosing freely always, or are we determined in our choices? And in the context of sexual autonomy, this is a big issue. Why? Because there are social norms. Society shapes us in many ways, especially about our sexual and gendered behaviors, and that creates injustices. For instance, women are taught to be nice and to put other people's desires before theirs. Like, you're, you're asked to smile, to listen to other people, to be pretty, to be understanding, to be generous, to be altruistic. But men are taught, uh, for instance, that um, they have sexual desire at all times and that it's very important for them to um, uh, exert their sexual desire and to be sexually active. So women are taught that um, what they really want in life is a stable relationship and that men want to have sex. And so if you want a stable relationship, you should agree to have sex. Men, on the other hand, are taught that deeply what they want is to have sex and not to have a um, long-term relationship. And so um, because of that, sex is often conceived as a sort of trade-off, a negotiation. So, of course, you can imagine that all these social norms shape our choices. What does it mean? Like, does it mean that it's, it's as easy for a woman to say yes or to say no? Will a man respect her no if she's scared that a man may exert violence if she says no? Does it mean that she gave her consent if she didn't say no? Um, if we have social norms of heterosexuality, how can we give consent or not give consent in the context of non-heterosexual relationships? Does it affect our ability to choose that we rather have desires toward the same sex and towards the same gender, and, and but the, the supposedly right way to do things is to have desires for people from the other gender? So you see, that uh, constricts our, our autonomy. It's not, then we understand that choosing to have sex or not is not like choosing to have uh, tea or coffee. So that's the first problem. What is sexual autonomy in a society that is so, so deeply shaped by patriarchal social norms? Then there's a question of what exactly is consenting to sex? So the most common view in the current philosophical literature on consent is to say 
that um, consent is giving up on your rights, so waiving your rights, such that you create a moral permission. So uh, more precisely, it is defined as a formally valid agreement, which transforms an action that would otherwise wrong me, because it would trespass my rights, into something permissible that is consistent with my rights. So to give you an example, you're not allowed to have sex with me in general because I have a right to my bodily integrity. But if I give you my sexual consent, then I am giving you permission to have sex with me. And in that case, you don't violate my sexual um, uh, integrity. But then the question is, how do I consent? What is it exactly that I do? Is it just that I think that I'm okay with having sex with you? Is it okay for you to have the right to have sex with me? Or do I need to tell you something? So of course now we think, oh yeah, of course, like you need to say something for a consent to exist. But at the same time, we also think that what really creates the consent is that you have the mental attitude of being okay with it. We, we think that if, if, for instance, I was telling you, oh yes, you can have sex with me, but I really, really didn't want to, we would still think that there is a problem with the consent that has been given. So more and more philosophers think you need both. You need both a mental attitude and a communication, because also it's not enough that I think uh, that I that I consent to something to give you the permission. Like for instance, if I walk in the streets and I think, oh, I will give uh, my book to the first pe person I run into, this person is not allowed to just take the book out of my hands without me telling them it's okay, I want to give you this book. So that's the first question, like what exactly is consent? Uh, but then, how can the other know that I consented? For the longest time, what has been thought was that as long as you don't say no, it means that you consent. And so um, it, it was the way, and it's still the way in Israel that uh, rape law is conceived. Like, you need to show that you've been forced to have sex against your will for it to be a rape. And so that shows that if you didn't fight back because you were scared or because um, like the person was constraining you or the person was threatening you or because you didn't see, you were very scared of what would happen if you were to say no, we consider that you consented. Um, and, that's, and, and that's a problem because of course it is very hard to say no in general in life. And um, there are uh, studies of linguistics that show that in general, when you want to say no to someone that, you want to refuse something that someone offers you, you never, you never just say no. It's rude to just say no. You say, well, I don't know, I'm gonna think about it, or is it, mm. And so in normal life, we know very well how to read those hesitations. So we know that, saying no is very harsh. And if you don't want to upset the person, you never just say no. And especially if you're a woman where you're trained to be very nice to other people. And so other people said, well, actually only yes means yes. So you have to verbally give your consent and your affirmative consent for saying yes. But what if you say yes and you're, because you're actually scared. So this is what, uh, some philosophers have called the gray zone. There are a lot of cases where women say yes to men for a variety of reasons that can be that they're scared, but that can also be that they are they don't want to be seen as a tease and that they seduced the man and then they didn't want to have sex with him. So for a lot of reasons, you can also say yes and not mean it. And then the third question is, what do I consent to? If I consent to be kissed, does it mean that I consent to have sex? Like, what is what is the limit? And you see it a lot in the, the trials about rape or in the, the common discussions about rape when you have people who say, well, she went to his hotel room 
uh, how can she say he raped her? Well, that is, is it consent to sex to go to someone's hotel room? That's that's not sure, right? So these are very complicated uh, questions. But in general, um, once we agree on what consent is, typically uh, usually saying yes, there are three. There there are different intuitions. We can think that um, saying yes is a necessary condition for sex to be permissible in the sense that if you didn't say yes, it means that this is a rape. But then is it a sufficient condition for sex to be permissible? That Does sex need something else um, to be permissible than just the fact that you said yes? And in addition to that, if you say yes, is it enough for the sex to be good? Well, the, the examples that I gave you, the fact that you can sometimes say yes for reasons that are not good, like that you, you feel constrained or you feel um, scared, etc., mean that this is not enough for sex to be good. So my idea is that actually we are mixing up two ideas of consent. One is just saying yes to someone's proposition. And one is really accepting this thing in the sense that you deeply want it. But these two senses are completely different ideas. And very often we think that saying yes is enough for good sex because we mix up these two ideas. So I just want to um, summarize these two uh, meanings very briefly. So one we have developed is the idea that saying uh, that giving a, a, a formally uh, valid consent means that you agree. So you waive your rights and you give rights to this person to do something to you. But then we also have another view on consent that is inherited from the philosopher Kant, right? Uh, or maybe not right. You may not know about this and this is perfectly fine. But Kant explains that what makes a will a good will is its ability to be its own law. So literally autonomous, like have, make your own law, autonomy. So to act morally is to act according to a law that is produced by our autonomous will. And in, if we do, then each choice, each agreement and each consent is a manifestation of our autonomy. And if it is a manifestation of our autonomy, it is a manifestation of our freedom and it is a manifestation of our humanity. So we engage ourselves in each time we exert our autonomy. And so that leads Kant to say, uh, to give a, a version of what is this moral law that we follow that says, I'm quoting him, act that you treat humanity in your own person as well as in the person of any other always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. So this is a bit uh, complex, but it means that to act morally is to have two different duties. One is to not use others as means or as just means, and a positive duty to treat them as an end and to recognize their being, as, uh, their being what Kant calls ends in themselves. So the negative duty can be interpreted as just the fact that you should not just treat people as objects. So in sex, it means you cannot uh, just use someone as a source of uh, satisfaction. Practically, it can be seen that Tal shall not coerce Noah into having sex uh, because if Tal does that, Tal treats Noah as a mean to the fulfillment of their desire and pleasure. So you need, to not just treat the other as an object. But the positive duty is, includes more restrictions. It implies that you need a form of respect and love for others. It's a very demanding criterion. It means that you need to pay attention to the particularities of the person to take seriously that they're not just autonomous human beings, but individuals that can have cognitive limitations, that can have partial autonomy, that will affect their ability to consent. And so that shows that this is a very demanding thing in intimacy. It means you need to make sure to treat others as the persons that they are and to ask them what they want and to make sure about what they want. So you see like consent then is very hard to obtain. 
And what I just wanted to show you is that it's not a problem that we have these two very different conceptions of consent. The problem is that we usually think, oh yes, consent means that the sex is good because we think consent as the Kantian consent, that is a very hard criterion to meet. But then we think just saying yes is enough to meet this criterion, which is not the case. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a case. I'm gonna make you imagine a situation where it is consent in the first sense, but not in the Kantian sense. So again, we're having Tal and Noah. So Tal meets Noah on a dating app. They don't know each other. Tal is looking for intimacy. Tal is hoping to, to get a, a lasting relationship. Noah, on the other hand, is looking for a single sexual encounter. But Noah doesn't tell Tal that they just want a one night stand. They, they act in caring ways that are commonly conceived as signs of romantic interest. Noah knows that Tal may be looking for a relationship, but they don't say anything. And Tal agrees verbally to have sex with Noah because they think they're building a re uh, lasting relationship and this is a step in a lasting relationship. Tal has not properly deceived, uh, Noah has not properly deceived Tal. Tal has formally consented to uh, having sex even in an only yes means yes uh, definition of consent. And so we could say that Noah has not used Tal as a mean, but Noah has not displayed the love and respect for Tal that are necessary to treat them as an end in themselves. They have not thought, okay, like I know that the reason why they're having sex with me is because they're hoping to be with me in the long term and that I'm kind of misleading them in letting them have sex with me. And so here we see that you can give your consent but it doesn't mean that you express your autonomy in this consent and that in order for this consent to be an expression of your autonomy, this requires a relationship with the other that is way more substantive, way more important. So this technical uh, argument has many consequences for the role that should be attributed to consent in sexual ethics. But one that I find particularly interesting is the role that con consent can play to help us understand what is going on in what is commonly called the gray zone. That is the sexual relations that are not raped by legal standard, but that are not sex that is happily willed by both partners. In the aftermath of Me Too, many feminist activists have argued that any form of non-consensual sex is wrong and should be understood to be raped. But a lot of them have meant it as the second uh, category of consent, that any sex that is not fully consented to is rape. And, and so do we agree with that? Does it mean that any kind of sexual encounter like this should mean that the man should be sent to jail? So I'm, I'm happy to talk about this with you in, in the Q&A, but I, I think on the other hand, distinguishing between the two understanding of consent allows us to understand that from the perspective of law, consent should be a valid formal agreement. It should be just saying yes. And saying yes is a good way to distinguish the sex that is permissible and the sex that is forbidden. Law cannot send you to jail. If you, ha you ask someone to have sex with you, they said yes, and, and the sex was bad. But Good sex is not just permissible sex. For good sex to happen, you need to treat the other as a person. In that context, consent cannot just be something you say at the beginning, you say yes. It needs to be a conversation in which we really care about the other person wants, about what the other person feels, and about what we want and what we feel. And that means that we cannot just conceive of sex as a sort of commercial exchange of desire and pleasure. You need to understand sex as a relation, as a conversation in which there has to be respect. So thank you very much. I will now uh, take questions. I think you can uh, send questions and I will, and they will be sent to me. Um, 
just I'm checking if I've received any questions so far. Um, so so far there are no questions. Please, like I'm I'm sure you do have some questions uh, because this is a very um, technical and complicated um, topic. So please, there is no dumb question. So ask whatever you want about this. I'm I'm very happy to talk more about points you would want to make or. Um, so I don't know exactly what to proceed if there are no questions. Um, I will wait for a minute or two to see if there are questions and otherwise I will probably stop the talk. So please ask me questions. <laughs> Okay, well, it doesn't look like there are any questions, so I will probably stop here. Um, thank you very much. Oh, so is there no way for one night stand to be good? Oh, so that's a very good question. Yes, of course. You can absolutely have a very good, morally good one night stand. It's just that it has to be so first of all there are a lot of ways for one night stand to be permissible but if you want it to be good then you need to be attuned to the other person it can be that you see that this other person just wants a very um uh simple exchange of sexual services for instance like you you can know that this person just wants to exchange oral sex with each other or give oral sex to you or receive oral sex from you or have penetrative sex and not talk or on the other hand or like have sex and a conversation about other things but what matters is that you don't just treat the person as an object of sexual pleasure but that you understand that they're also a person and that you care about them being also a person with their own desires and pleasures. And so if that other person is on the same page as you, it's perfectly fine. If you're not on the same page, but you know that you're not on the same page, you're not using them. What is morally uh, objectionable is if you should have known that they're not on the same page and you could have known in paying attention to them but you just did not so um for instance you see that like imagine you meet in a club i i spent um my fair share of time in uh tel aviv clubs you're in a club you have a super nice time you meet this person you like you're very attracted to each other you make out on the dance floor you decide to um, come back together you arrive home you make out and suddenly the person is less into it you feel it usually you feel if the person is suddenly uncomfortable or suddenly less enthusiastic but yet you have sex with them or like they they try to talk to you about things and you're like, no, 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 we're not here to talk, let's have sex. That's here you're doing something objectionable. If then they say no, you're doing something impermissible. If they say, yeah, yeah, let's have sex, it's fine. You're not doing something really wrong, but you're some doing something morally objectionable. But if they're still like enthusiastic about it and you're enthusiastic about it, and you're interested in the fact that they're enthusiastic and you too, then it's morally right. And it's even morally good, sorry. So no, there there are plenty of ways to have one night stands. You don't so so that's so it's very good that you asked this question because it also enables to see the difference between respect and love. 
and I think the problem is that the way men are socialized, especially, they're constantly told that if they're respectful with women, women are going to see it like they're ready to have a relationship. And so I think a lot of men prevent themselves from being respectful because they're, they think, well, I don't want the person to think that this is a relationship. This is a one night stand. So I'm going to treat them like very carelessly so that there is no misunderstanding. But the problem is that it doesn't have to be the case that being respectful is seen as a sign that you want to have a relationship. Quite the contrary, you could respectfully say, I'm very excited at the prospect of spending the night with you, but this is a one night stand for me or, or not make any promises. The problem is if you know that the person wants a relationship and you let them believe that there is the possibility of a relationship. Um, yeah. So um, don't hesitate if you have another question, maybe. I don't think I'm receiving anything else. Um, I'll wait one more minute. Oh, no more questions. Okay, well, thank you very much for attending and um, I hope you'll have a great night um, in Tel Aviv clubs, maybe. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>